interested in proceedings of a court, court no judgment, and others which do not affect them to obtain safe except expressly forbidden by law. Judgment and orders of the court, including matrimonial cases, which are heard in camera at the end of the day, they are published in the law reports. And you get to know what happened. International best practices. Generalist. Article 14, one of the, of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, ICCPR, provides for hearing of cases in public unless the court excludes the press from the trial or part of the trial for reasons of morals, public order, national security, or the private lives of the parties. But criminal judgment shall be delivered in public, except where a juvenile has interest in the matter, or the proceedings involve, involve matrimonial disputes, or the guardianship of children. The same provision is, re is repeated in Article 6 one of the European Court of Human Rights, and it also promotes open justice in criminal trials and judgments. In the United Kingdom, the law is now settled that, that judges sitting on cases are on trial. And open justice allows the public to assess the judges who are accountable to them, your demeanor, your comportment, because the video is on you. In the case of our against Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, it was held as follows, quote, justice must be done between the parties. The public must be able to enter any court to see that justice is being done in that court by a tribunal consensuously doing its best to do justice according to law. For that reason, every judge sitting on judgment is on trial. Without the commitment of an independent media, the operation of the principle of open justice will be irredeemably diminished. Unquote. The author argues that open justice should be introduced to allow journalists to broadcast live proceedings to educate people on the procedure in the courts. The 2012 election proceedings, who saw live broadcast of the proceedings, made a lot of people develop interest in law and should be encouraged. As a result of that, quite a number of, uh, of people decided to read law. Restrictions are imposed on journalists who take notes from the court to report to the public, but the author is, is of the opinion that those restrictions should be lifted as journalists are supposed to educate and inform people about some cases in the court which are of public or national interest, including criminal and constitutional cases. South Africa, they are on the lead, set up the pace in the case of NDPP against Media 24 Limited and others, and H. Van Breda and 24 Media Limited and others, where the Supreme Court of Appeal from the High Court, you go to the Supreme Court of Appeal. Affirming the decision of the High Court, which allowed video recording of proceedings held as follows. Quote, pencils and sketch pass are now considered anachronistic. There is no restriction regarding filming outside the court, nor is there any restriction regarding attending in court and taking notes, drawing pictures, or upon assessing pictures. The restriction relate to the means of gathering the information and the place where it may be guarded. There's there simply can be no logic in a court permitting journalists to utilize the reporting techniques of the print media by not permitting a television journalist to utilize his or her technology and method of communication, being the broadcasting and recording of the proceedings, despite the fact that live camera footage will be more accurate than a reporter after fact summary. The reporters, they may not get, get accurate inf information, but live TV, everybody will see. The South African court permitted the television journalists to set up their cameras 15 minutes before the hearing of the case and to use stationary elected video cameras to be operated without human movement, which would disturb the court proceedings. Prior to the delivery of the above-mentioned case, in 2009, the Supreme Court of Appeal issued a practice direction allowing full audio-video broadcasting of its proceedings. The Constitutional Court of South Africa has also issued a practice direction allowing full audio video broadcasting of its entire proceedings, which are constitutional cases contained in practice direction mentioned above. The Federal Court of Canada has settled the issue of, of restrictions imposed on court reporting and held that court must be open for full coverage and its proceedings to afford persons who cannot physically attend court for obvious reasons, including adequate space, the opportunity to observe the judge's temperament, the witnesses called, the evidence adduced, and how they will be and how they, were how they were discredited and the arguments put up by their parties. The United States, in the Supreme Court case of Richmond Newspapers versus Virginia, held that 
the first and fourteenth amendment permit unrestricted freedom of speech of the press and there is a presumption of openness in all criminal proceedings and print and electronic media should be given unfettered access to the court to promote accurate recording to be assessed by the public. In United Kingdom, the Supreme Court, in the case of R. Ravi and others versus the Security Service and others, authoritatively heard that open justice is a common law fundamental human right principle and not a mere procedural rule. Lord Diplock, in the case of Attorney General versus Levra Magazine Limited, held that open justice is a requirement on the court to promote accurate publicity of their proceedings to a wider public and to, be, and to build public confidence in the court and at the same time prevent judicial arbitrariness by making judges accountable. The present position in most, in most, in most jurisdictions is to promote open justice system to ensure fairness, accountability, transparency in adjudication Journalists should be given the opportunity to educate the people on proceedings in court where the law does not require close hearing. It is recommended that the Judicial Service of Ghana must be funded to broadcast live all important constitutional, criminal, and human rights cases. Journalists should be given unfettered access to, to televised live proceedings from courts. This will ensure that the information is is disseminated without any distraction to the court process. This will promote the free flow of information and dissolve the myth about the courts and their proceedings, which are owned by the public, who appointed judges and magistrates as their trustees, unless it will not be in the interest of public morality, public safety, public order, or otherwise stated by a court as provided by Article 126, Cross 3 of the Constitution. Limitations to access to information, sexual information. There are limitations on access to pornographic images of a child or any other person and has been criminalized unless secret recordings of other matters or conduct which have been criminalized and can be published despite their consequences. The law is that a person who takes or permits to be taken an indecent image or photography of a child or, pro or procure him for the purposes of publication of whatever kind, including storing it on a computer, commits an offense. And the minimum sentence is five years. A person who uses a computer, online service, internet service, or local bulletin board service, or any electronic equipment capable of storing or transmitting information, who deals with a child, including luring, soliciting, seducing, grooming, enticing, or attempt, or aid, and abet any of the above acts for the purposes of sexual abuse, or, or any information that will disclose the identity of the child in connection with sexual activities, including production charts, the child's telephone number, electronic email address, physical description, picture, or, or cyber stalking of the child commits an offense. State secrets. It is also worth noting that some categories of information are classified as state secrets. Thus, under the State Secrets Act 1962, Act 101, the communication of such information is a criminal offense. Plagiarism. Persons are entitled to information for their use and for other purposes, including education. However, they are to disclose their sources of information. Plagiarism is committed where a person copies from someone else's academic work or ideas, such as papers, web pages, books, and articles as their own work, and takes credit for it without acknowledging the source. Plagiarism is considered as fraud and amounts to academic dishonesty and a scarlet sin. The right to information that does not authorize a person to copy another person's academic work or ideas and take credit without acknowledging the source. Plagiarism is a civil wrong and authors who have been found to have plagiarized for academic purposes are disqualified from the use of that information and are penalized by demotion, withdrawal, or dismissal. Madam Chair, I have about 10 minutes to wonder. I will finish soon. Access to information and copyright issues. Copyright is a form of intellectual property which gives the owner an exclusionary right to prevent others from copying, performing, selling, displaying, and making derivative versions of the work of authorship. Although registration confers several advantages on the owner of the copyright, it is not a prerequisite to copyright infringement. The Copyright Act in Ghana provides a list of works which are eligible for copyright. The works which are Copyrightable in Ghana are literary works, artistic work, musical work, sound recording, audiovisual work, 
choreographic work, derivative work, and computer software or programs. Folklores are also protected under the Act, but rights of folklore are vested in the President on behalf of and in trust of the people of Ghana. Furthermore, not all unauthorized uses of works which are copyrighted constitute an infringement. There are exceptions where the use of the author's works is, per is, is permitted or allowed, even without obtaining the consent of the copyright owner. This is referred to as fair use, which is a well-defined or limit to copyright protection in the world. Where the work of an author is to be used for commercial purposes, the consent of the author has to be sought first. However, not all commercial uses are forbidden. Most newspapers are sold for, are sold for profit, yes, yet they are not automatically excluded from benefiting from this doctrine. Fair use seeks to advance news reporting by journalists or broadcasters, public interest on topical issues, researching or teaching purpose for classroom use. Under the permitted use in Ghana, journalists have the right to report or reproduce in the media political speech delivered in public, speech delivered in public during legal proceedings or lectures, addresses, sermons, or other work of a similar nature delivered in public. Where the use by reproduction to public is exclusively for the purpose of reporting fresh events or new information. Works which enjoy copyright protection can be used without the consent of the author for the purposes of reporting an event or new information only. Communication for teaching purposes or for the work and broadcast for use in educational institutions without infringing copyright protection. Conclusion. Access to information makes public officers accountable to the public who are their beneficiaries. It promotes transparency, as any wrongdoing by a public officer is likely to find itself in the public domain as general information. Arbitrariness in public offices is curtailed in a regime where there is unfettered rights to access to information. Access to justice includes open justice, which permits free flow of information in court proceedings through television and other print and electronic media to give accurate report of what transpires in court to avoid allegations of bias, accusations, counter accusations against the court where only prints journalists are allowed. This one normally happens where you deliver your judgment and it is reported differently. But if the actual judgment has been given or they are allowed to terrorize, it will reduce distance. The importance of, of access to information cannot be underestimated. This is necessary for the development of every democracy. Today, I've shown the various means by which information can be accessed by various individuals. These avenues must be explored to further foster transparency and, and accountability from the leaders who we, we as a people have elected. We are talking about people who we as people have either elected or appointed to hold public offices. Few acknowledgements. I would like to take this advantage to acknowledge Nana SKB Asante in particular, his advice to me in terms of my academic pursuit, and my um, editors, Sarah Bedu, my, my sister of the Attorney General Department, my son, Kwame Riafi Esquire, in private practice, Kofi Mawunyo Ajaho, my former teaching assistant, Judge Mrs. Christina Khan, and my friends from the court. <laughs> Thank you for your attention and good evening.
I'm an Achimotan. I used to be a student. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, my congratulations to the distinguished speaker. Uh, it was a very erudite uh, presentation, and my question for the speaker is, looking at the, the, the topic that you dilated on, do you think that Ghana, in light of the many constraints that you outlined with regards to our right to information, we do have a right to information? Because if certain parties are asked, they would say that we do not have a right to information insofar as there are constraints like payment of fees for gaining access to information, insofar as there are constraints like information officers being able to subjectively determine whether or not to release information. I think you, you understand pretty much where I'm coming from. Because do we or do we not have a right to information in light of all of these constraints? In light of uh, people being able to subjecti subjectively say whether or not they will release information which is supposed to be made available to us. That, that is my question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, have one more question and then the speaker will respond. And we will end there with the questions. Any more questions? Yes, please. Hello, thank you very much for the empowerment you have given us. A question only relates to section 75 of the Act in respect of fees. By my reading of section 75, the fees is not a major issue. 
because it does appear that the law says, for as long as the information I seek is in the public interest, it must be free of charge. And then, if it is my personal information, if I am disabled, I must get it for free. Then, in respect of Section 80, about the application of the Act to existing and future information, would you not say that in the terms of the law, it overrides all other acts as far as seeking information is concerned, including the Court Act, so that the Court Act will not hold sway because of the express terms of Section 80. Thank you. Let me address and answer West question first. The question is, do we have right of information in Ghana? In reality, yes, we have. We have right to access information, and the law is there. Apart from putting in an, in an application to assess information, every public agency and all private bodies which are funded by the state are mandated to provide manuals every 12 months indicating the information that they have about the agency, their branches, what they do, and, and all relevant information must be contained in that manual. That's why if you want to secure a copy of the manual, you can make photocopies without paying any fee. So that's why, to some extent, it is available. But the question is, I'm merging the two now, the one from, from Samson. The, the question now is, if you look at the law, it provides that some, under some uh, instances, the information may be obtained free of charge. But who determines whether it is for that purpose? It is determined by the information officer. If the information officer refuses, what you can do is that you repeat it at the head of the unit. The head of unit may also affair it. And the law says, go to the high court for judicial review. Cost implication has arisen. Who is going to pay? And even if you are not lucky and you lose, cost, cost may be awarded against you. <laughs> so these are the implications. Then the question about having a provision, the Right to Information Act, which is in conflict with some provision in the Cost Act. Here, we, we, we are going to use interpretation to resolve them. The Right to Information Act is a general law on, on information. Then the Cost Act is a specific law regulating the court. And the general principle is that where a general law is in conflict with a specific law, the, the specific law overrides general special rules non derogant. Assuming they were of the same character, where the right to information had been uh, a specific law as against the cause act, then that one, it would have been the latter, legis prosperous promise. But in the case of this one, the, the right to information act is a general statute. So where it is in conflict with a specific act, the specific act will override, despite the time that the, spe the specific act was made. Thank you. Sir Judge Dennis, thanks for your delivery. I have a very simple question. Maybe it will benefit students. What of right to access of examination script? A student goes for remarking or a student is dissatisfied and he wants the script, wants to know the marks on that, that information. What would be the position? Well, at times some of them are funny. For example, where where I teach, the law school, the entrance exam, it is the, there is a, a statement that you cannot question anything about the examination. And in this modern world, you, 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 you tell somebody that if I assess you, you cannot question, you cannot assess any information. It is of no consequence. And, and that one cannot oust the jurisdiction of the high court. So uh, the, the question of oust across will not, because you cannot use, you cannot use um, Alstar crosses 
in private documents to oust the jurisdiction of the court. So that one, it will be defeated. Now the question is, you have written examination, you've paid for it, then you want to see your marks. They are saying that they will not make it available to you. You demand, if it is refused, if it is refused, assuming we are talking about the law school, you demand, if it is refused, then you petition the IEC, the chair. If it is refused, you can go to the high court for judicial review, for the, for the resource scripts to be, to, be, to be produced. The question is, why is it that when some people fail, they write the exam, they pass? So I think that I have passed, and we are saying that I have failed. Let me see the script. So it is permissible. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that we've had a wonderful presentation this evening. I want to thank Sir Dennis for an erudite presentation of such an intriguing topic. He has been so comprehensive, so thorough, covering all the possible grounds on the parameters to the right of information and its impact on Ghana. I don't intend to summarize his presentation because it is uh, very explanatory and we can all follow. So I just want to make a few remarks. He started and the basic statement that he made was that information is paramount in every aspect of our lives and in development. He also told us that there are four main modes of access to the right of information. But the principal ones are those derived from Article 21, 21 f from the 1992 Constitution, which guarantees the right to information as pertains in a democratic society as a fundamental human right. He also made it clear that governments and public offices as fiduciaries and other state organs that perform their public functions are under a legal obligation to be transparent and accountable to us, we the people or the citizens by making available to us accurate, authentic, and incredible information. And the other important aspect to that is the um, Right to Information Act of the 2019, Act 989, which he said was established. And from what he said, we realized that this 2019 Act, which was passed, had some limitation clauses, which journalists, for instance, found as very limiting. 
I must say that when this act was passed in 2019, I think there were many civil society organizations which hailed it as a possible tool to curtail in some way corruption. But the limitation clauses have not made it possible for uh, many of the issues that uh, some of the uh, civil society organizations find will be useful to monitor uh, issues that pertain to government accountability and transparency, especially due to the uh, limitations that have been given concerning information relating to the presidency, the legislative, and the, judici uh, and the, the judiciary and the legislative arms of government. So, from all that he said, we realize that, yes, as citizens, we have rights to information. And people like journalists who have it as their profession also need certain rights for information. But the information, the rights that we have are not as free as we think they are. But then we have the right and we can use them as individuals, as citizens, and they are also available to us but the government and the government arms of uh, the, 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 the arms of the government should make available to the citizenry when required information that will help in building a democracy in our society. On this short note, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I think we are really very grateful to our distinguished scholar, jurist, and law educator for giving us such a wealth of information. And I think we have learned a lot to carry with us. We know our rights so far as the information, so far as our rights to the information bill is concerned. And we will thank him for the opportunity for giving us and appraising us of his knowledge concerning this topic. Let us therefore give him a round of applause by <laughs> by expressing our profound gratitude for the time and the research that he has undertaken to feed us with this information. We are very grateful to you and we look forward to your next lecture, which I think will be next year, when you come back from the UK. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. And I know that you have found the lecture very interesting and educative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emerita Professor Adefio Shandoff, our chairperson, for those closing remarks. We have now come to the end of this evening's event. But before we go, I'd like to acknowledge 
our sponsors. Um, as you can see, they have been indicated on the poster, but I'd like to acknowledge them here. And they are Dr. Charles Amwa. Asanko Mining Limited. Ya Asantua Rural Bank. KAS Life Company Limited. And Mr. Daniel Boating. CEO of DBS Industries Limited. We appreciate your support for this event. I'd also like to acknowledge the core Adishmine Sacred Coral Group from Kumasi and Accra who have provided us with such melodious music this evening. Thank you for supporting our speaker, even though he hasn't sung with you for quite a few years. <laughs> and we cannot forget the schools, our students, who have been here with us this evening. We have students from Achimota Secondary School. And Presec Legon. Thank you very much. I hope you have learned a lot that you can take back with you to share with your colleagues. The next um, the, uh, you know, event coming up here at the academy is the Ephraim Amu Memorial Lecture, which will be delivered by Most Reverend Dr. Peter Kwesi Sapong a fellow of the Academy and the Emeritus Metropolitan Archbishop of Kumasi. This lecture will be delivered here in the auditorium. The title is The Performing Arts, Morality, and the Ghanaian Identity. The date for this lecture is um, I think 19th, there's a, an error here, I beg your pardon. The date is the 19th of May, and the venue is this auditorium. Please join us for this lecture, which promises to be very interesting and enlightening. There will be refreshment, light refreshment, outside the auditorium. So please make sure that you get something to eat and drink after sitting here for um, an hour or so. <laughs> OK, two hours. <laughs> Um, the the uh, fellows, fellows of the academy and dignitaries, um, you will have your refreshment in the fellows lounge. The Adishmai Sacred Choral Group will be served their refreshment here in the auditorium. So please um, remain here. 
as the rest of us live. Thank you very much. And see you again on the 19th for the Ephraim Amu lecture. Thank you. And, uh,